Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Beat the Winter Blues. My name is Lauren King, and I'm the Provider and Community Relations Liaison at Coastal Hospice. Welcome to our Caregiver Academy. Among our attendees today, we are happy to see so many familiar organizations with us. We have some colleagues from Title Health, Wicomico Nursing Home, Delaware Hospice, Mac Incorporated, and many more. It's wonderful to see all of you today. You may see myself or my colleagues, Alejandra and Joy, pop up in the chat box to help or address with any technical issues. I wanna thank you for your patience ahead of time, should we have any. I'll also come back at the end to discuss the program evaluation. We will be using the chat feature to communicate with you throughout the webinar. You can access it by clicking on the messaging icon in your meeting controls. Our webinar today will be moderated by Lauren Blair, Provider and Community Relations Manager. Lauren has more than 15 years of experience in the healthcare field. She is a Maryland licensed master social worker and a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Delaware. She is also on the board of directors at the Gray Center of Maternal and Women's Health. Lauren, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that introduction. It is my pleasure to welcome our panelists here today, Joel and Janelle Byler. welcome. Thank you. I'd first like to welcome Janelle. Janelle has over 15 years of professional experience as a therapist working with children, teenagers, adults, marriages, families, addiction, grief, and more. Janelle is a pastor and an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene and served as a children's pastor at Cross Point Church of the Nazarene in Salisbury for 16 years. She has experience leading seminars and groups, preaching and teaching, and speaking at retreats. Janelle also serves as a pediatric bereavement counselor for Coastal Hospice. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and English from the Eastern Nazarene College, a master of arts degree in Christian education from Nazarene Theological Seminary, and a master of science degree in pastoral counseling and spiritual care from Loyola University in Maryland. She has her LCPC, NCC, MCRSP, CT, and is an approved clinical supervisor. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Joel Byler. Joel has been a chaplain for Coastal Hospice for six years. Joel is a pastor and an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene and served as a worship, visitation, and community life pastor at the Cross Point Church of the Nazarene for 15 years. He has a bachelor's degree in business management from Eastern Nazarene College and a master of divinity from Nazarene Theological Seminary. Joel and Janelle have been married for 29 years and they have two adult sons, Jacob and Javid, and Albrea, new daughter-in-law, Kayla. We are thrilled to have you both here with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Joel, tell us about our goals for today. Well, our goals are uh, identified in these three um, pretty broad goals, um, but I uh, think it will be very helpful uh, in, in, in attaining these today. One, uh, to become familiar with uh, seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. So, uh, and I will say straight up, when you hear the word sad, just don't think down, but remember that sad uh, for today means seasonal defective affective disorder. Um, secondly, to recognize how it presents in your own life and the life uh, and the lives of those that you help and that you interact with each day. Uh, and then also know how to be prepared for it and to treat it effectively. And these will be our primary goals today. Wonderful, wonderful. But Janelle, what are the winter blues? Is it even a real thing? Uh, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, and so we all know what it is to be blue or to be down. It's part of the human experience. Uh, and it's common to hear ourselves commiserate after we've collectively moved our clocks back an hour, how the days are shorter, it's getting dark early, it's getting cold, I miss the sun, I need to go somewhere warm. Um, those are all parts of this time of year and just kind of that overall kind of blue down feeling we sometimes get. So what's the difference, Janelle, between the winter blues and seasonal affective disorder that Joel talked about? Yeah. Um, so the term winter blues is really kind of a catch-all phrase. For some of us, the winter blues um, are no big deal. Um, but for others, the winter blues are, are more than a feeling um, of getting frustrated about it getting darker soon our ability to function well is actually affected uh, by the winter months. And so there's an official diagnosis for this. It's a form of depression called seasonal affective disorder. 
And so today we're going to process some information about SAD from the DSM-5 TR and the National Institute of Mental Health. And then we're going to look at what we can do to beat or to treat this reality. And so many people, uh, again, go through short periods of time where they feel sad or not like themselves. Uh, sometimes these mood changes begin and end when the seasons change. People may start to feel down when the days get shorter in the fall and winter and begin to feel better in the spring uh, with longer daylight hours. In some cases, these mood changes are more serious and can affect how a person feels, thinks, and handles daily activities. If you have noticed significant changes in your mood and behavior whenever the season change, uh, you may be suffering from seasonal affective disorder, again, which is a type of depression. Uh, in most cases, sad symptoms start in the late fall or early winter and go away during the spring and summer. This is known as winter pattern sad or winter depression. Some people may experience depressive episodes during the spring and summer months. Uh, and this is called summer pattern seasonal affective disorder or summer depression and is less common. So Joel, what are the signs and symptoms of seasonal affective disorder? Uh, so SAD is not considered a separate disorder, but is a specifier for a major depressive disorder characterized by its recurrent seasonal patterns uh, with symptoms lasting about four to five months per year. Therefore, the signs and symptoms of SAD include those associated with major depression and some specific symptoms that differ from winter pattern or summer pattern SAD, as Janelle was just talking about, um, not every person with SAD, seasonal affective disorder, will experience all of the symptoms listed here. But a reminder, these are symptoms of major depression, and they include um, feeling depressed most of the day, nearly every day, uh, losing interest in activities that you once enjoyed, experiencing changes in your appetite or your weight, um, having problems with sleep, um, feeling sluggish or agitated, having low energy, feeling hopeless or worthless, having difficulty concentrating, or having frequent thoughts of death uh, or suicide even. And so then the additional specific symptoms for winter patterns sad, or, uh, sad may include oversleeping, uh, also known as hypersomnia, overeating, particularly with a craving for carbohydrates, uh, weight gain, uh, and social withdrawal, feeling like you want to hibernate and, and isolate. So how is SAD diagnosed? Well, if you think you may be suffering from SAD, talk to your healthcare provider or a mental health specialist about your concerns. Um, that's straight up. We just wanted to remind you of that. Um, to be diagnosed with SAD, a person must meet the following criteria. They must have symptoms of major depression or the more specific symptoms listed above that we just uh, went through. The depressive episodes must occur during specific seasons, i.e. only during the winter months or the summer months, for at least two consecutive years. However, not all people with SAD do experience symptoms every year. And then the episodes must be much more frequent than other depressive episodes that the person may have had at other times of the year during their lifetime. I have a question. Are there people who are more susceptible to SAD than others? Um, SAD is more common in people with major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. Additionally, people with SAD uh, tend to have other mental disorders such as attention de deficit hyperactivity disorder, HD, AD, H, HD, uh, ADHD, and eating disorder and anxiety disorder or panic disorder. Uh, SAD sometimes runs in families. Um, SAD is more common in people who have relatives with other mental illnesses such as major depression uh, or uh, schizophrenia. Very important to know. Thank you. Janelle, who develops SAD? Yeah, so let's look at how common uh, seasonal affective disorder is. About 5% of adults in the U.S. experience SAD. Uh, it tends to start in young adulthood, usually between the ages of 18 and 30. SAD affects women more than men, though researchers aren't sure why. And about 10 to 20% of people in America may get a milder form of the winter blues. And so, uh, yes, it's only 5%. That may not sound like a lot, but that, that's millions of Americans. Uh, and so while millions of American adults may suffer from SAD, many may not know they have the condition. 
Um, SAD is more common in those living farther north where there are shorter daylight hours in the winter. For example, people living in Alaska or New England may be more likely to develop SAD than people living in Florida. Uh, I spent five years of my childhood living in Denmark, which is pretty far up there, uh, latitudinally. And I remember going to school in the dark, coming home in the dark. Uh, there was a time we went three months without seeing the sun at all. And so folks who live in these areas of the world uh, have a lot to teach us about how to not only function, but thrive during these times. And we'll take a look at that together here in a few moments. Wow, three months without seeing the sun, that would be difficult for me, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Joe, what causes SAD? Scientists uh, do not fully understand what causes SAD. Um, research indicates that people with SAD may have reduced activity of the brain chemical serotonin, which helps regulate moods. Um, research also suggests that sunlight controls the levels of molecules that help maintain normal serotonin levels, but that in people with SAD, this regulation does not function properly and therefore resulting in decreased serotonin levels uh, during the winter. Other findings suggest that people with SAD produce too much melatonin, a hormone that is central for maintaining the normal sleep-wake cycle. Overproduction of melatonin can increase sleepiness. Uh, but both the serotonin and melatonin help maintain the body's daily rhythm that is tied to the seasonal night-day cycle. In people with SAD, the changes in serotonin and melatonin levels disrupt then those normal daily rhythms. And as a result, they can no longer adjust to the seasonal changes in day length, leading often to sleep, mood, or behavioral differences. Uh, we talked about sun uh, for, for a couple times already. Deficits in vitamin D may exacerbate those problems because vitamin D is believed to promote serotonin activity. In addition to vitamin D consumed with diet, the body produces vitamin D when exposed to sunlight on the skin. Uh, with less daylight in the winter, people with SAD may have lower vitamin D levels, which may further hinder serotonin activity. Uh, negative thoughts and feelings about the winter and its associated limitations and stresses are common among people with SAD. It is unclear whether these are causes or effects of the mood disorder, um, but they can be a useful focus for treatment. So glad that there's treatment options. Mm -hmm. Do you know how is SAD treated? Uh -huh. So treatments are available that can help people with SAD, and I hope that you're hearing um, so far, like th there's a reason, this is a real thing. You're not making it up. Um, you experience these changes uh, for a reason and that there's hope, there is treatment. And so uh, treatment can fall into these four main categories that you see here, um, and they can be used alone or in combination. We have light therapy, we have psychotherapy or talk therapy, uh, antidepressant medications, and vitamin D treatments. And so again, talk to your healthcare provider about which treatment or combination of treatments is best for you. But let's look at these one by one uh, so you can kind of take a look at what you might want to explore or suggest to those that you work with or those that you love. Uh, let's start with light therapy. Since the 1980s, light therapy has been a mainstay for the treatment of SAD. It aims to expose people with SAD to a bright light every day to make up for the diminished natural sunshine in the darker months. Uh, for this treatment, the person sits in front of a very bright light box every day for about 30 to 45 minutes, usually first thing in the morning from fall until spring. Uh, the light boxes, which are about 20 times brighter than ordinary indoor light, filter out uh, any potentially damaging UV light, making this a safe treatment for most. Uh, people with certain eye diseases or people taking certain medications that increase sensitivity to sunlight may need to use alternative treatments or use light therapy uh, under medical supervision. These are fairly easy to get. You can order them um, on Amazon. I think there's one sitting somewhere at our house not being used. Joel Byron. Maybe. 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 Um, next, psychotherapy or talk therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of talk therapy aimed at helping people learn how to cope with difficult situations. Uh, a form of CBT has even been adapted for people with SAD and is typically conducted in two weekly group sessions for six weeks and focuses on replacing negative thoughts related to the winter season with more positive thoughts. CBT also uses a process called behavioral activation. Uh, 
which helps individuals identify and schedule pleasant, engaging indoor or outdoor activities to combat the loss of interest they typically experience uh, in the winter. Uh, when researchers directly compared CBT with light therapy, both treatments were equally effective in improving SAD symptoms. Some symptoms seem to get better a little faster with light therapy um, than with CBT. However, a long-term study that followed SAD patients for two winters found that the positive effects of CBT seemed to last longer over time. And uh, we'll be taking a closer look uh, at CBT here in a moment. So let's look then next at medications. Uh, because SAD, like other types of depression, is associated with disturbances in serotonin activity, uh, antidepressant medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are also used to treat SAD when symptoms occur. And so these agents can significantly enhance patients' moods. Uh, common SSRIs include Prozac, Celexa, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, there are many others. Uh, and it's okay to be on these medications through the winter months and then titrate off. Or if you're already on one of these medications, you can increase your dosage through the winter months. The FDA has also approved another type of antidepressant called Welbutrin in an extended release form that can prevent reoccurrence of seasonal major depressive episodes when they're taken daily from the fall until the following early spring. Uh, all medications can have side effects. Uh, talk to your doctor about the possible risk of using these medications for your condition. You may need to try several different antidepressant medications before finding one that improves your symptoms without causing uh, side effects that you don't want. I'd encourage you to speak to your doctor about getting uh, the gene site testing done. This is a simple cheek swab uh, that's sent away and comes back with a list of medications that work best for your specific genetic makeup. Uh, and alert you to the medications that you will most likely have side effects from. So that can take away that trial and error approach to medication and finding the right medication for you. Finally, let's look at vitamin D. Uh, because many people with SAD often have vitamin D deficiency, nutritional supplements of vitamin D may help improve your symptoms. However, studies testing whether vitamin D is effective in SAD treatment have produced mixed findings with some results indicating that it is as effective as light therapy, um, but others detecting no effect. So again, talk about that uh, with your primary care uh, physician. So many treatments, so many interesting treatments that we can that we can talk about and share. Thank you, Janelle. I'd like to turn to you, Joel, and ask, can SAD be prevented? Um, because of the timing of the onset of winter pattern SAD, um, because it's so predictable, people with a history of SAD might benefit from starting uh, treatments mentioned above before the fall, um, before the fall season, to help prevent or reduce the depression. Um, to date, very few studies have uh, investigated this question, so it is a good question. Uh, and existing studies have found no convincing evidence that starting light therapy or psychotherapy, the talk therapy Janelle was just talking about ahead of time, um, could prevent the onset of depression itself. Um, only preventative treatments with the antidepressant Welbutrin uh, prevented SAD in study participants, but it is also a higher risk of side effects. Uh, therefore, people with SAD should discuss with their healthcare professionals if they want to take in, uh, or initiate treatment early to prevent some of these uh, depressive episodes. And so before we dive into um, the CBT that Janelle was talking about a little bit uh, more in depth, let's take a look at those symptoms one more time and notice if any of these feel familiar to you. Um, so again, just kind of look down over this list um, as we uh, head into CBT, but uh, the, um, the issues of depression or hopelessness, loss of energy, anxiety, heavy leaden arms and legs, social withdrawal, oversleeping, loss of interest, appetite changes, weight gain, or consequences concentration problems. Good. Thanks, Joel. So let's take a minute and look at CBT. If you've got paper and pencil beside you, I'd encourage you to just draw a simple triangle uh, and take some notes as we look into this. This will just give you a little bit of a taste of what talk therapy can look like. It'll give you some free therapy right here at this uh, webinar. Um, and just, I think this is such a fundamental concept to overall health, whether you struggle with depression, anxiety, seasonal affective disorder. Um, this is a, a beautiful way to understand how you were made 
uh, that you can engage with every single day. <clears throat> and so the premise of CBT is that as human beings, uh, we are thinking, feeling, doing people. So that this idea that our, our thought, how we're thinking can affect how we feel and what we do, what we're feeling can affect how we think and our behavior, what we do, or sometimes what we're doing can affect how we feel and how we think. And so the idea here is that these three are constantly interacting with each other. They're constantly informing each other, whether you're aware of it or not. And so by becoming aware of it, you can be much more intentional about your health, your wholeness, be much more aware of your internal world and its relationship to the external world. Um, so let me unpack this a little bit for you. And again, I encourage you to jot down notes, uh, throw a question in the chat if you need to um, as I go. But this is an example of some of this stuff that you'd be able to do uh, in therapy with someone. Um, so for starters, I think it's important to note that we all probably have a preference uh, or one of these three that we feel we are naturally more like gifted in or we feel stronger in. Think of yourself right now and others that you know, uh, but some of us really rely on our minds. Um, we need to understand. We need to know. Uh, we, we think a lot. We can tend to overthink sometimes, um, but we really kind of hold the mind over these other two as far as importance and value. And we uh, take comfort in being able to know and to understand and to think things through. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of about yourself. Uh, others of us are really driven by our emotions. Uh, we're all heart. We wear our emotions on our sleeve. Um, for some, we may know what we feel and we're very in tune with our emotions. We're emotionally intelligent. For others, we're feeling the emotions, we let them lead us, but we're not really in tune with them. We're not aware, we wouldn't know what to call what we're feeling, but we kind of trust our feelings and we follow our feelings around and more than we do what we're thinking. Um, then there are others who are doers. Uh, these, these are the people who have a hard time just sitting down and resting. You ask them to sit on a couch, like, I, I can't do it. Oh, I'll sit here, but I gotta be doing something while I'm sitting here. Um, for them, often they're, you know, it's about performance, getting things done. That's how they feel uh, best in their own skin. Uh, and so again, none of these is wrong, but I think it's important to know what your, your bent is, your tendency, what you're going to fall back on. Uh, and then I'd like to suggest that potentially for some of us, our greatest strength can also be our weakness, uh, where we struggle the most. Um, but what is important is, is to recognize that we have all three available to us, and the goal is to be able to have all three informing whatever is going on in the moment. Um, so let, let me give uh, an example, say, from therapy um, or an example I often use in therapy to kind of explain how this is happening all day long, whether you're in tune with it or not, right? And so um, I'm going to start with a thought. So say the thought is, and I'm afraid this is true, so don't judge me, but the thought is I hate to go, I hate the gym. <laughs> I hate to go to the gym. I hate to exercise. I don't want to exercise. I hate exercise. That's what I'm thinking. And then I'm feeling like I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I, I'm, I'm feeling low and lazy and I don't want to. And so then what's going to happen over here is I'm not going to do it, right? But if I'm aware, I can I can approach it a couple of ways. One, I can go, yeah, Janelle, but you know that once you get there, like, you know, this is the right thing to do. Just, do, you know, just do it. Or you can turn off your thinking and your feelings and just do it. If you just, if you just leave work and turn right instead of left and go to the gym, um, once you get there and you start working out, you're going to suddenly start to feel better. And as you feel better, you're going to leave the gym going, I love the gym. I'm totally like, I'm totally a gym person. I'm going to do this again tomorrow. Right. So these things are influencing each other um, or just you wake up and you just kind of feel low. And then you notice that you're not thinking as clearly as you normally do. And it affects how you perform at work or uh, you're doing something that you don't like to do and it makes you feel anxious and then you start having thoughts about yourself that you are you know you're a failure you're no good um you know the insecurity starts to come up and you start to think thoughts that aren't true aren't accurate um so and then another perspective i think that might be helpful uh for this audience is is also understanding that depending how you are affected even by seasonal affective disorder or again just in general um 
it's important to know which one you're coming from so that you know which other two to use to leverage to help. So for instance, as a therapist working full-time here at LifeMark, you know, I might have clients who come in who are having thinking problems. They're having intrusive thoughts. They're having cognitive distortions. They're believing things that aren't true and they're struggling. Well, we can, we can look at emotion and helping them understand their inner emotional world and what their emotions are trying to tell them. We can look at things that they can do um, in order to help them with this struggle up here with the, the cognitive stuff. Or I might have people who come in who are having emotional dysregulation or they're experiencing anxiety or they aren't in tune with their emotions or they are overwhelmed by their emotions. And in order to get better in this emotional world, we can look at changing how we think about emotions. We can understand what emotions are telling us. Uh, we can look at things that we can do when we're feeling a certain way in order to help this corner, or if sometimes people come in and they've got behavioral uh, struggles, they are they are doing things they don't want to do. They've got addiction issues, or they can't do something that they do want to do. And if that's the case, then we can look at how they're thinking and how they're feeling to help them meet their goals around the behavioral uh, issue. So I, I want us to keep this in mind as a way to approach winter, getting through seasonal affective disorder in understanding how is it I'm thinking? How is it I'm feeling? And how can I be in tune with that? What is I'm doing and not doing? Uh, and again, the idea is to keep all of these intention and constantly available and, and contributing to the process, not ignoring one whole side or two whole sides and thinking that that's going to uh, get us through. So um, I th that's CBT and kind of the uh, uh, quick version. Uh, I, I think it is so cool and has so much potential um, and applicable, again, to the realities of what we're looking uh, at today, but also wherever you find yourself in life. Super helpful, Janelle. Thank you. And as Janelle mentioned, um, she lived in Denmark when she was younger, and they have a word for how they navigate living so far north. This is also a concept that they just value and do well as a country. Janelle, would you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Joel doesn't want to say the word because it's hard to pronounce. Okay. So the Danish word is huga, and huga is a, a Scandinavian concept. Again, it's part of how they get through uh, these winter months. It's actually kind of become a buzzword uh, even here recently uh, in the U.S. Um, you'll find this word on things. I think it's even in like the Frozen 2. There's a song about it in the Frozen 2 Broadway show. It's kind of cute. But um, Huga is this idea of um, cozy, being with people you love, having uh, warmth, textures, tastes, um, this kind of idea of hunkering down, but in a good feel good way. Uh, we we don't really have a word in English that captures all of it. It's like everything you see in that slide, all those pictures put together, that's huga. Uh, and it's something they're very intentional about. Okay. Um, and so again, it's that's they value, it's how they approach life in a way that's a little different than we do here in America. Um, and if you've been over in Europe, uh, in some of these Scandinavian countries, especially, they're, they're not chasing, uh, I don't know, I don't know, fame or more, or like they, they want to build a good, healthy life and they want to enjoy that life. They're not, you know, they, they stop working and they're done. Um, they, they, they have some balance that's pretty nifty that I don't think we, we really have here in our country uh, the way we could. And, and Huga is part of it. And so being intentional about how, you know, rooms are put together and inviting people over and being done with work and giving yourself permission to rest and valuing rest. Um, again, this is candles, this is food, this is cozy clothes, this is the fireplace, this is a hot cup of tea or coffee. This is like leaning in hard uh, to winter, even, you know, when you think about clothes uh, that come from that part of the country, you know, we might just like suck it up and run into Walmart and freeze. And it's like, no, like, you know, have a good coat, have a scarf and a hat and gloves or mittens that you love and taking the time to bundle up and get out there and enjoy the brisk uh, wind. It's, it's, um, it's, it's this concept that is, that is beautiful. And I would like to offer it as, as a way that we can approach seasonal affective disorder, uh, Feel free to research this. You will find all sorts of stuff on it. 
Um, but but Huga uh, goes to even what we were just talking about in the CBT, you know, how we think about it, things that we can do, how we intentionally make ourselves feel a certain way. Uh, Huga captures this beautifully. You don't have to tell me twice to curl up with a cozy blanket and a hot cup of tea and binge Netflix. That's, you know, that's no problem. To, that's great to me. I was thinking even even with the icebreaker stuff that we did at the beginning, uh, if you were a part of that or look back in the chat bar to look at some of the suggestions people gave for here, you know, for things that, you know, some of us already are engaging in. I think, yeah, that was a good exercise to, at the beginning. Um, look back in the chat bar if you if you if you logged in late and missed some of that. So good. Absolutely. Good idea, Joel. Great. So what about where we live, Joel? Well, here on the Eastern Shore, we have a variety of rural and urban settings. Um, we have cycles of planting and of harvesting and land lying dormant. Um, we are also surrounded by water and the seasons connected to watermen and seafood. Uh, we have tourist seasons uh, and cities that fill up and then empty out um, based on the season um, that we're in. And here on the Eastern Shore, we also have the dynamic of weather switching back and forth from warm to cold or uh, the season shifting suddenly instead of gradually. Um, you've always heard it said, wait five minutes, it'll change. Um, that's very, very true for the Eastern Shore. Uh, again, let's just not be surprised by this. Let's know this. Let's take advantage of it. When it is December or January uh, and it's suddenly warm for one day like it was on January 2nd of this year, um, go outside, go golfing like I did. That was so fun because all of a sudden in the middle of winter, you're out golfing with friends. Um, go for a walk, whether you feel like it or not. Remember the CBT that we just talked about. Right. And what else can you do? Let, let's look at you know big things, little things. So maybe you plan your trips to warm places during these months, like know your limits, know how long you can go before you need to change the scenery or change of temperature, save wake, uh, vacation time and use it in the winter months. Uh, if you know this is good for your mental and emotional health, be purposeful about when you plan time away. Like we we get through the holidays, you know, November, December is pretty good. We get, you know, starting the new year, but come February, March, you might need um, to be very intentional about doing something for your mental and emotional health. Uh, meet with friends and family in person, virtually, make a point of it, uh, get through the winter months together, um, meet up with people to exercise, have weekly Zoom meetings to check in on each other. Um, but then I also, I want to take a minute, let's look at this paradox too, and balance that I think needs to be involved in SAD. Um, uh, Cause I, I feel like part of what we have um, been exploring so far is this idea of kind of fighting against the winter um, and the struggle. But I also want to suggest that we uh, need to cooperate with winter and what winter has to offer us. And maybe you've seen some of these kinds of pictures in your social media feeds, but um, I love this, you know, kind of to me, it's a, both of these are cozy pictures, but the one on the left there, that's, you know, the plants and the earth are resting. Maybe we should too. Uh, the long days will be here uh, soon enough. And so again, this would be an example of changing how we think about winter from that CBD perspective. You know, we, we go hard, you know, and winter is this invitation to just slow down, sleep more. Like the trees are, the plants are, the animals are. If we were to take our cue from nature, um, we would be resting. We would be sleeping. We would be okay that we might put on some weight and it's going to come off again, once we're active again, um, or like this picture on the right here, you know, just kind of like this, this cozy hibernating, you know, going underground for a while. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, again, we want to be careful about isolating and you know what you need, but I, I want to offer both. And again, this idea through CBT of being able to tune with yourself and know what you need to know on any given day, it might be that you need to kind of Huga hard and push back. It may be that you kind of just need to embrace and give yourself permission to be in winter. It, it's not going to last. And it's a good thing. It's just as deserving a season, is just important in the cycle of a year as any of the other three seasons. So I just want to kind of offer that, that paradox, that both and, uh, and being able to kind of flip back and forth 
and trust yourself to know which it is that that you need. I hope that makes sense. It does, you know, I love that idea of balance of listening to ourselves and to our needs. I think that's just just exactly what we need in these winter months for sure. I did have a question come through on the chat box. It says, I don't have a uh, vacation time or money to take trips to warm places. Where does that leave me? Yeah, right. That is a great question. Um, and so like, have fun, be creative. Maybe you only watch movies that are set in sunny places, you know, for two or three months. Like that's a rule for what you're binging and watching. Um, Use the light box, you know, turn the heat way up in your house for one night and have a luau party or something with friends like uh, it doesn't have to cost a lot. The idea is to be intentional and to be creative and to have fun in the ways that you kind of get through some of these months. It does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> What other practical real life options and ideas do you have for us to share? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I've got a whole list here ready to go. Please do kind of listen and write some of these down, maybe even brainstorm some of your own with friends and family and cross them off as you do them uh, through the winter months. Um, just a, a quick word, like it is 55 days till spring, everybody. Uh, you know, so maybe you you come up with like a countdown and it's 55 days and each day you're doing one little thing as you count your way down but uh here here are a bunch of things that you can do um to help you get through um these months so one maybe be intentional about getting up early to watch the sunrise um you go to bed early you know and set your alarm and and get up and just because there, there's some beauty to to winter sunrises that are very different than other parts of the year maybe you want to find a meditation app and you want to try it um, maybe you want to give yourself permission to paint or draw uh, maybe you want to learn a new language. Duolingo is a great little app that will have a lesson every day and you could begin to learn a new language during the winter months. Maybe you want to get a stack of novels and give yourself permission to read, uh, you know, under a blanket by the fire with a cup of tea, you know, all these things. Maybe listen to a podcast, uh, go through old photos, cook a new recipe, uh, enjoy the sunset. Again, like track the time and notice how the sunset's getting later and later by minutes uh, each night. Uh, dance to your favorite music, do yoga, Pilates, um, write a daily affirmation or, or record your favorite part of the day through these months. Um, maybe do some cleaning, take the time to purge. Donate things you aren't using so you feel like you've got some purpose and you're accomplishing something during these months. Uh, call that friend you haven't spoken to in ages. Buy flowers that you enjoy and bring them in the house. Uh, make some changes in your environment. Maybe move your furniture, rearrange something, or reorganize your closet or your garage. Um, buy something new. It doesn't need to be expensive um, just to have something new um in your space maybe it's even new toothpaste I don't know but just something new uh, can sometimes be invigorating make baths or showers more intentional use bath bombs or shower steamers like take your time enjoy it don't just see it as something you need to get done um, do something different with your hair visit an online museum get a manicure or pedicure and maybe choose a really tropical or summery color or maybe like enjoy some winter colors um, keep a daily gratitude journal, uh, help someone else in a big or small way, uh, volunteer at coastal hospice or tidal health or a local nursing home, um, make a point of making other people's days brighter. Um, so these are some examples of behavior, that behavioral act activation that we mentioned in CBT, something you can do. And sometimes some of these things, and again, you have to do them, you know, you can't just think about them, but doing them will change how you feel and, and how you think about how you're doing and getting through uh, these winter months. I love those great practical tips for us, Janelle. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, I turn it over to you. Yeah, so uh, we're um, coming through uh, most of this session and uh, just wanted to wrap up some, come some of the uh, these thoughts and uh, just kind of put these thoughts out there uh, in summary. Um, remember that beating the winter blues is a real thing and uh, sad is a real thing. Um, recognize uh, and to go into the season, go into fall and the winter months and the cooler temperatures, um, prepare, talk, start talking about it with your friends and family in the fall, uh, preventatively and before time. 
Um, know that it is coming and make plans to treat it. So just remember all those other uh, options that we, we've talked about. Um, go to your doctor, start medicine if appropriate. Um, as we just talked about, plan a trip somewhere warm uh, in January, February, or March when you know you will most need a change of scenery or some of those thoughts about doing something creative locally if you don't have the money to do that. Um, buy that light box. Um, I'm selling the one here at our house um, for, a, for a small price. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> Um, stock up on candles like you see behind me, um, cozy blankets, hot drinks uh, that you enjoy, uh, puzzles, um, projects to do, um, again, in some of those lists that we've shared and uh, will be available um, uh, at the end of the, the series as well. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. I did have a question come through from the chat box from Rachel. It says, what about grief? Can we confuse grief with sad? And can sad intensify grief? Uh, wow, that's a, that that is a good question, and um, the response would be that our grieving process can certainly be affected by the time of year that our loss occurs. Um, let's be clear: grief is not a disorder. Grief is the healthy and normal response to loss. Um, so it's it's kind of another layer of what we've been talking about today, but um, especially with what we do in coastal hospice, um, that is a, that's a very, very good question. Uh, we often experience symptoms when we are grieving, um, when we have a loss that are similar to the symptoms that we've been processing today. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it is similar and yet, and yet different and yet all involved. Um, some of us may have experienced um, being annoyed that the sun is out and life seems to be going on as usual when it when it feels like our life has ended due to a loss. Um, the idea of it being cold and rainy and uh, is somehow comforting um, the day of a funeral. If you've lost someone recently um, and the day of a funeral is kind of overcast, it's just kind of reminds you of how you feel on the inside. Uh, and for some with sad, it might actually feel fitting and feel like good timing to grieve and to, to go through that process during the winter when, when we're kind of already feeling that way. Um, for others, sad may make normal, healthy grief symptoms feel intolerable. Um, just kind of, again, accentuates uh, the, the snowball rolling um, and adding more and more layers um, some people are more private in the grief process and others need to grieve in community. So again, uh, different ways in which we handle that. Um, and, and healthy grieving probably includes a balance of both. And I think that's what I would say, you know, for, for all, everything we've talked about today is, is find that balance, find what is appropriate for you. And please know that here at Coastal Hospice, um, we have grief groups that are available and bereavement counselors who are able to support individuals and families in the community, regardless, and hear that word, regardless of whether the death occurred under host, uh, Coastal Hospice care. Uh, and thank you for throwing that slide up. Um, we have um, spirituality and grief support groups that are, um, you can go on to coastalhospice.org. You can see where these are posted, but this is just one. Uh, there's even a QR code that you can scan and look at it. Um, registration is free, space is limited, but it, it doesn't have to uh, be a coastal hospice death, but you can see times coming up. Um, uh, this is a six week support group on Mondays from February 20th to March 27th. Um, and uh, the three to four time may not suit you, but another time that we offer may suit you perfectly. Um, there are also bereavement counselors. Uh, if you call directly into coastal hospice, um, in fact, they're on the bottom line of that slide. Um, you can it could call in um, that to that number um, and talk to a bereavement counselor, someone that can uh, is already. Um, that's what I love about our bereavement support system is that they are um, um, trained in thanatology, the study of grief, and uh, so they are very very capable and very able to uh, to help you. And that number is four one zero seven four two eight seven three two. 
and then extension 334 if you want to talk to Christina Puig Lego, who is one of our uh, bereavement counselors. Uh, great, great options. And again, keep an eye on our on our webpage, um, even where the link to this video will be later on as well. So yeah, great, great question about grief and just the complexity of all of this. Um, the the winter blues <laughs> or the sad affective disorder uh, or that depression or now even grief on top of it all. So absolutely. Yeah, and that reminder that there's help out there, right? So whether if it's grief, like you've just gotten some great contact information, here's some more information. Uh, just again, to know that if you're struggling, there are people uh, and programs that are ready to help. Uh, this is what they do. Uh, and so hopefully we've given you today, um, you know, some great tools uh, to handle kind of uh, winter blues, seasonal affective disorder, um, you know, that falls in, you know, normal human experience realms. Um, if, if you are struggling to function, if you are uh, having suicidal thoughts, if um, you are not okay, please, please, please. Uh, do reach out uh, here in our community. Uh, you, I mean, you can go to the ER. We've got mobile crisis. We've got uh, a, a mental health ER even that's new here off of Eastern Shore Drive. Um, so just just please don't feel badly for doing that. We, we all need help at different times in our life. Um, so please know that people are ready and, and want to be there. Such important information, Janelle and Joel. Such wonderful tips and tips for our toolkits that we can use for us all winter long, um, not just for us, but for the people that we come in contact with every day. So thank you both. If there's one thing that you would like us to take away from this webinar today, what would it be? What's our key takeaway that in your eyes? Joel, I'll start with you. Um, my key takeaway uh, is simply the reminder that we are all different. Um, I was saying uh, something similar just a few moments ago. Uh, we all handle life differently, um, whether it's simply the winter blues or the seasonal affective disorder or grief that we just talked about, uh, or <laughs> any combination of those. Um, we are we're going to handle things differently. We're going to handle things on different levels. We're going to have different outlooks. Um, and so respond, and that would be a key takeaway. Uh, so respond in a way that is true to who you are and to what you need. Um, don't, um, and I would even say that for what we presented today, don't just because Janelle said something or just because I said something, don't take that and uh, and, and run with it if it doesn't suit you. And I would say just make sure that it suits you, make sure that it fits your personality and what you need most and what is going to help you best, whether it's the winter blues or sad or um, or grief or any combination therein. It's a great perspective, Jill. We all don't have to fit in one bubble. It could be uh, a different, different things and different aspects that we take away. Thank you. Thank you. And Janelle, how about you? Yeah, for me, I think the key is that idea of balance, right? The idea of being in tune with your mind, your heart, your emotions, your body, and giving yourself permission to lean into what winter, what winter has to offer you uh, and not be afraid, but then also know when you need to do something to kind of fight back and keep yourself in that Huga mindset. I think kind of keeping both of those uh, that those can share space together, like keeping both of those before you and tending to them both um, seems like a, an important takeaway to me. I agree, Janelle. I love the thought of, yes, fighting back and let's let's do the things that we can do to combat our winter blues, but also embracing some of those things about winter that we may not be able to enjoy in the summer. So thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us. I greatly appreciate it. Lauren, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you to both our panelists today, Joel and Janelle Byler, for this presentation on a topic that may be relevant for many. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We hope the information was useful to you. We encourage everyone to attend our next webinar on Tuesday, February 28th at 12 p.m. titled Black History and Healthcare, Past, Present, and Future. Please visit our website to register. To wrap things up, we ask that you take a couple of minutes to fill out the short survey. It's only five simple questions. Your feedback will help us bring relevant programs to you, your practice, and those you care for. When you click leave the meeting, you will receive a survey from Zoom. We will also send you the link to the survey in a follow-up email to you. 
This was a presentation from the Coastal Caregiver Academy, supporting and empowering caregivers in our community. We are here for you and can call us at any time on the number on your screen. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm Lauren King and have a wonderful rest of your day.